Imagine that you are Eric Benson, CEO of Caspian Sea Drinks. Today is February 1st. Caspian Sea Drinks has $33,000 in cash. But there's a problem. You, as in Caspian Sea Drinks, have promised to make a payment on April 1st. You promised Sean Stovall and Justin Pearson that you will pay them $119,000 by then. If you don't, they get control of the firm. What should you do? Alex and Spencer are your shareholders. They're relying on you to make the right decision. They're relying on you to figure out a way to keep the company because if you don't, this company that, well, Spencer hasn't worked hard for it, but that Benson and Alex have spent the last couple of years of their life working for, if they don't make this payment, they go bankrupt, and these two other guys, who they may not even like that much, are going to take control of their firm. So what should they do? Don't think about should in an ethical or moral sense. Think about should in just a purely rational sense. And I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not saying that ethics and morality don't matter. They do. But just think about the rational thing to do. The rational thing to do is to gamble it. Take this money to Vegas or to Atlantic City or buy lottery tickets or do something because there's no way you're going to find a reasonable, wise investment that will turn 33000 into 119 in two months. And think about what you care about. Do you care if you pay these guys zero? So what if you lose everything and you have zero? Versus if you had $33,000 to give them. Versus if you had $118,999.99. These are all the same to you. Any, any one of these numbers, anywhere in between zero and this, you lose the firm, you go bankrupt. You have to make a payment of $119,000. This sets up a basic conflict. Think about Stovall and Justin. What do they want to happen? They want Mr. Benson to take this money, put it somewhere safe, and on April 1st, give them the $33,000, or <clears throat> maybe they earn a couple hundred dollars extra, they give them $33,000 plus some interest, and they'll take control of the firm. But if that happens, Alex and Spencer and Benson, they're all losers. They want to do something risky because these guys are the residual claimants. They get the money that's above this. They don't care about anything below it. So this sets up a basic conflict. There's going to be a conflict between the equity holders and the debt holders, or sometimes called the bond holders. In general, the equity holders want to take riskier projects and the bondholders want safer projects. So if you're going to loan money to a firm, what do you want to know? You want to know that you can trust these guys. You want to know that the CEO, Mr. Benson, is going to do what he should do with the money. Now you'll write a contract and in that contract you'll tell him you can do these things with the money and you can't do those things with the money. Basically, you want to say you can do smart, wise things with the money, but you can't do dumb or dishonest things with the money. But there's no contract in the world that's going to lay out those terms perfectly. At the end of the day, before you loan money to a firm, you have to trust in two things. Trust in the competence of the people and trust in their integrity. If that trust is not there, the bondholders don't loan money because they realize there's always this conflict that the equity holders have a different payout rule than the bondholders have and because of those different payout rules they see the world differently and what they want is going to be different and the bondholders know that the CEO is going to act in the best interest of the shareholders. Okay, that's one conflict. Now let's think about another possible conflict. Do the equity holders always get along perfectly well? So we have Benson, who is the CEO of the firm, and he makes most of the day-to-day -day decisions, but Alex is also in day-to-day -day operations, so these guys are the management. So think of these as managers and owners. Do they always see things the same way that Spencer does, who put money in, but he's just a passive investor. He doesn't decide how to spend the money. He doesn't decide how to raise money. None of that. What does Spencer want to happen? He wants to see these guys, Benson and Alex and everybody, work 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Everything has to be 
working for him, working for him, maximizing his wealth. He doesn't get tired, Spencer that is, doesn't get tired when Benson and Alex work hard. So what about Benson and Alex? Well, they're going to work hard. They want to do this. But there's a trade-off. When they were just working by themselves and they were out selling Caspian Sea drinks under the tree on campus, and let's say they made, they said, you know what, we could work another hour. We're tired. It's the end of the day. The sun's hot. We can work another hour and we'll make another $10. If they do that, they get $5 each, right? They get to keep collectively the whole $10. Now, when Spencer's the owner and they work that extra hour, Spencer owns 30% of the firm, he gets $3. These guys split $7. So you see, when you have passive investors, there's a difference here. There's the work that you used to do that you got all the benefits of. Now you share those benefits with somebody else. Think about when they get to be a bigger firm. What if they decide, I want a really nice office. I want Class A office space in the best building in the city. It's very expensive, but I'm there working every day and enjoy working in that wonderful office with floor to ceiling windows. That's great. Spencer doesn't want them to do that, though, does he? Because even though they enjoy that work environment, that's money they spend on that office space that Spencer doesn't get. So money coming out of this money machine, there's less coming out now for them to split up. Well, maybe these guys want to get box seats, or maybe they want to have a corporate plane or corporate cars. There are plenty of ways for Benson and Alex to waste Spencer's money by not working hard, by buying things they don't need, by renting expensive office space. So we have this conflict. It's called the separation of ownership and control. So separation of ownership and control. In this case, Spencer doesn't own the whole thing, but he has an ownership portion of it, but he has no control. Benson and Alex are his agents. So this is also called an agency conflict. The agency conflict is when your agent, who's controlling the business that you have ownership in, acts in its own best interest, not in your best interest. Once again, what does this come down to? This comes down to trust. I have to trust that Benson and Alex have the ability to run my business the right way, and I have to trust that they have the integrity to run my business the right way. Because I can have different governance controls, I can have different things in place, I can basically look over their shoulder to make sure they're doing the right thing. But I can't look over their shoulder all the time with every decision. That would make me the manager. So there are two conflicts here, and both of those conflicts are both best handled if there's some trust and there's some ethics. So that's important. Uh, there's a conflict between the bondholder and the shareholder. The shareholders in general, not always, but in general, want to take a little bit more risk than the bondholders. There is conflict between management and owners. That's the separation of ownership and control. It's an agency conflict where somebody you've hired to work for you really works for themselves. And think about the goal of the firm. The goal of the firm is to maximize shareholder wealth. But what really happens? Benson and Alex, the managers, are going to maximize their own wealth. So Spencer has to think about ways that he can ensure that these two guys act in his best interest not their best interest. That's best done if we know I can trust these guys. Other than that, I have to come up with ways to align their incentives by the way I pay them or to monitor them, to look over their shoulder all the time. So those are the basic two basic conflicts in finance.